Asante Africa Molweni, we have spoken in a previous episode about the dangerous new land expropriation bill before Parliament. This bill could see your property expropriated without compensation by government as part of their plan to consolidate state control over land in South Africa. We examine what South Africa could look like in a future where farmers are forced to rent land from the state instead of actually owning their own property. And we'll hear some real life stories from farmers who've already fallen victim to government's failed land reform program. But first, we'll take a look at the weekend headlines. The African National Congress's National Executive Committee has adopted guidelines, you'll be well aware, for criminally implicated members to step aside. But it remains unclear what the party leadership plans to do about its Secretary General, Ace Mahashule. Three months since Ace Mahashule was formally charged, and he has said he is going nowhere. And the public protector, Busi Siwem Kobani, has a case to answer on counts of misconduct and incompetence. That is the blunt recommendation of a panel of three independent experts to parliament. It's now up to the national legislature to run with it. The United Democratic Movement has met with the management of broadcaster ENCA to discuss the alleged conduct of parliamentary reporter Lindsay Dentlinger. EFF MPs could face action in the House. At least 18 of the party's MPs are also set to face possible sanction for storming the podium in July last year in an attempt to block the public enterprises minister Pravin Gordon from delivering his budget vote address. Both those matters were before Parliament's Powers and Privileges Committee today for discussion. The increase in crimes recently have confirmed that the country's justice system is in dire need of a boost. In fact, according to the Forensic Science Laboratory, the current DNA backlog stood at more than 170,000 cases. This week in the headlines, we are one step closer to removing the public protector from office. It turns out the Lindsay Dentlinger video was fake news and the Red Berets are back to their usual shenanigans causing chaos in Parliament. But first, last week the Daily Maverick and City Press released the ANC's so-called step-aside guidelines. And surprise, surprise, ex Mahashule is going nowhere. Get this, all reports by the party's integrity commission must first go through his office. So reports about ACE, implicating ACE, must first be signed off by ACE. Yes, you heard that right. ACE will be the person who is responsible for determining his own punishment. He will also be the one to decide whether the ANC acts on a report at all. It's this kind of logic that reinforces the notion that the ANC is no longer even pretending to respect the constitution or the rule of law. The EFF are up to their usual bullying tactics. Last week, EFF MP Nazir Paulson hurled racist remarks at parliamentary staff and DA MPs. When called out, he reacted with threats of violence, telling the DA's Pumzile Fandam that he would deal with her outside. This is all the same week that Parliament's committee finally, after two years, found 16 EFF MPs, including Paulson himself, guilty of contempt of Parliament for the same sort of thuggish behaviour. The EFF are a bunch of hypocrites. They claim to fight gender-based violence but have in their own ranks somebody like Paulson who threatens to assault female MPs in Parliament live on national TV. And I want to say this, no one should ever believe that the EFF is committed to fighting violence against women. They don't believe it because instead some of them are even perpetrators of such violence. After the dust has settled on the Lindsay Daedlinger racial saga, it appears that the video was in fact doctored montage. If you missed the story, an ANC reporter was accused of racially discriminating against members of parliament. The video quickly circulated of her apparently only asking black politicians to put their masks on and let her their white counterparts when interviewing them. But after News24 did further investigations, it was discovered that the video was in fact distorted, placing together new and older interviews. Some of the clips originated from even before COVID-19, and some were before masks were even legally mandated. The EFF and the ANC, are do did not, without doing their due diligence, labelled Dentlinger and ENCA being racist on the basis of a fake video. 
This was hugely irresponsible from both political parties because their actions further stoked racial tensions among South Africans for their own narrow political gains. We have therefore laid a complaint for, of race baiting against the ANC and the FF with the South African Human Rights Commission. As leaders in this country, we have a responsibility to build this nation and not to divide the nation. DNA evidence is crucial for solving cases of murder, rape, and other crimes. However, in South Africa, we have a massive backlog of DNA testing. Nearly 172,000 samples are yet to be processed. Our forensic labs are falling apart due to corruption and mismanagement. As a result, justice is being denied to hundreds of thousands of South Africans as violent criminals are released back into the streets to rape and murder with impunity. This is simply unacceptable and we will not rest until justice is served. It has been more than four years since South Africans bid farewell to their previous public protector advocate Tulima Donzela and we were shackled with the current public protector advocate Busisiwe Mkweban. What's been clear over the years is that unlike her predecessor, Mkwebane has been more concerned with protecting politicians than she has been about protecting the public. A great number of her reports emanating from high-profile corruption cases have been found to be deeply flawed, lacking in substance, riddled with basic legal errors, and showed clear political bias. The DA has long held that Advocate Mkwebane is not fit to hold office and should, in fact, be impeached. After three long years, an independent panel has now found that she's not fit for office. It is now up to Parliament to institute proceedings for her impeachment. Now, every MP will face a choice next week to vote to remove Mkwebane or shield her in the same way that they've shielded other people in the past. This is the ultimate test to put country ahead of party. And finally, for some good news, remember we told you about how the ANC was trying to silence your voice on the matter of the expropriation bill? Well, our efforts to fight against this have finally paid off. Parliament has agreed to invite stakeholders to make oral submissions on the proposed amendments. These submissions are likely to include experts in the field, pressure and interest groups, as well as relevant industry bodies. This is an important part of the legislating ma making process, and we urge relevant stakeholders to make use of this important opportunity. And you at home can also play your part by visiting our website and signing the petition. This will strengthen our case against this bill in Parliament. In more positive news, let's take a look at the work of our DA-led governments across the country in this week's DA at Work. Dear Governed Drakenstein has awarded 114 bursaries to deserving learners. 20 of them are specifically from learners from rural schools. The DA-led Mudimula Mukhopong has established a much-needed mobile unit for electricity maintenance. And the day governed Western Cape's new Blue Dot Taxi Project will reward improved driving and discourage illegal operations and conflict in the taxi industry. Now, on to this week's DA at Work feature, we are joined this morning by Councillor James Foss, who is the City of Cape Town's Mayoral Committee Member for Economic Opportunities and Asset Management.
Welcome on the show, James. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Good morning. Cool. James, I want to get stuck right into it. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had the Corporate Quarter Labour Survey releasing its stats. Uh, unemployment across all metros is at a record or high. And we've seen in the city of Cape Town that we are the lowest metro with the lowest expanded definition of unemployment. How are we doing this? How are we managing to keep uh, a cap on unemployment at rising levels? Well, it's about the basics. So in the city of Cape Town, it's about our reliable infrastructure, our ability to transact with land in a smart way that unlocks social and economic value. It's about implementing programs that will drive demand and make business sense. And so at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, I convened an economic task team consisting of policy and research specialists senior professional investment officers that understand the uh, economic uh, landscape very well. Mm -hmm. And so we looked at all the basics in terms of Cape Town's economic geography and what programs we could inter, uh, implement quickly so that we can help adapt uh, specifically our strategic business partners that receives funding from the city so that we uh, have a re-look at their business models and those strategic business partners work in a vi wide variety of sectors from clothing and textile, food and manufacturing, green technology, uh, call centers, yeah. um, tourism and hospitality even. So we looked at all of those key sectors and we implemented measures to stabilize our economic landscape. We also came up with specific programs, for example, a business retention and expansion program, yeah. which we rolled out in 26 of Cape Town's industrial areas so that we can quickly uh, help businesses with their current uh, financial uh, crises, their production. Um, so the business retention and expansion was really an important program yeah. to help stabilize, come up with programs and uh, measures to ensure that there's no further job losses or business closure, but also to expand. And so we've seen some exciting uh, expansion yeah. happening in Cape Town. I want to I want to just uh, circle back on this, James. I mean, you know, these are an incredible um, uh, initiatives by the city. But ultimately, I mean, these are life changing initiatives that they're for individuals. So people at home, because again, joblessness is about dignity, right? Yeah. So it is about ensuring that as many people in the city are kept in her work. That's a good point, because for us, it was about stabilizing our economic landscape. Because if you look at Cape Town's economic geography, it's made up of a lot of different sectors. Mm -hmm. So we had to come up with plans to ensure that we could keep those factories and businesses open. We had to do or make a lot of bespoke submissions to national government okay. to ensure that some of our production lines pivoted uh, their production to, for example, personal protective equipment. Uh, the food and beverage yeah. uh, factories, they had to continue producing uh, because many of these factories not only provide to Cape Town uh, markets, but also Africa and uh, global markets. Yeah. So, uh, even our boat building and marine manufacturing sectors, we had one factory in Cape Town with 150 vessels on the production line for export. Okay. So it's a sector that supports about 8,000 jobs in our city. So we quickly had to stabilize. Mm. Then we had to come up with new ways of doing business. Yeah. And so that was the exciting part where we worked day in and day out with our strategic business partners in the clothing and textile, in the green technology, in the business process outsourcing sectors to come up with new ways of working, the remote working, mm. uh, taking uh, opportunities to where businesses are located uh, so that we could keep those businesses open and avoid any further job losses. Mm -hmm. So the business retention and expansion program was an important intervention yeah. on the city's part. We also moved all of our operations online, mm -hmm. our business support uh, um, um, model, yeah. for example, the business hub. Yeah. So all of our activity had to be moved online so that we can assist businesses with accessing relief measures, uh, new ways of working, productivity even. And so we came up with a business in distress program, yeah. another outcome yeah. of our economic action plan working for businesses. And so that uh, business in distress program is where we join forces with Productivity SA to look at existing business
businesses? What are the obstacles holding them back? What's those production uh, like? How can we improve their uh, performance, their production? And so we went in with a team of specialists to go and fix the internal mechanics of businesses again to ensure that we don't see any further job losses or business closures. Tell me a little bit about the, the strategic business partners. I mean, you've, you've already identified, you know, textile industry mm. and the like. So, I mean, what do you practically do as a city to support those strategic business partners? And how does that translate to jobs on the ground? I think that's one of the success stories in Cape Town's economic approach. So we've realized that to get the best demand in key sectors, okay. you need to work with strategic business partners to address any developmental issues within that particular sector, investment, promotion and facilitation coming out of that sector. In other words, how do we take proudly Cape Town goods to world market? How can we export more and import less mm -hmm. so that we boost local production? And so these strategic business partners receive funding from the city of Cape Town and they receive their mandate from okay. us in terms of delivering on those key performance areas from clothing and textile, call centers, marine manufacturing, aviation, uh, food and beverage, green technology. So in each one of those key sectors, we have a strategic business partner, for example, Green Cape, Cape Town Tourism, Cape BPO, Blue Cape, West Grow, and others. Okay. And so within each one of those sectors, we task them with specific objectives so that we can see a return on our investment. One, on skills, number two on investment promotion, and number three, uh, also jobs. Okay, so one of the things that we managed to do at the end of last year is to create a couple of hundred of jobs. Um, I mean, has this been directly linked to the strategic partner uh, strategy? Well, tell us a little bit more yeah. about the jobs that we created. So we had a two-pronged approach. Okay. One was to get our strategic business partners to adapt quickly to the next normal. Yeah. So there was a lot of immediate issues we had to deal with because in terms of our uh, key performance indicators, we've realized it cannot be business as usual. So we worked around the clock with our strategic business partners to pivot their production, to come up with new business models, to increase their performance and their output. So it was one, strategic business partners, and number two, it was our own Department of Enterprise and Investment uh, located within the city of Cape Town, business interventions. For example, our dedicated investment facilitation unit that worked flat out during lockdown and, um, and we've landed a yeah. lot of new exciting investments. Yeah. So when other cities were closing down, we were keeping Cape Town open for business by speaking to our international partners, speaking to international companies, because it comes down to the power of partnership. Absolutely. So we were working very closely with our international missions uh, globally, uh, also international companies to make sure that they continue seeing Cape Town as a uh, destination of choice. So we had our dedicated investment unit. We also ran our own Cape Skills and Employment Accelerator program. Yeah. That was a new program that we came up with. We've designed that program specifically to create skills pipelines into these growth sectors. Because you can't just train for training's sake. So as a department and as a city government, we're putting a lot of money and resources towards skills training for these high growth sectors. And so the third program was then Jobs Connect, okay. because a lot of Cape Town people uh, find themselves in a very difficult spot. Your resume doesn't always have the right qualifications on it. And so in the Jobs Connect program, we came up with work readiness programs where we trained unemployed people in Cape Town with the right skills, whether it's computer literacy, uh, whatever other skill is required in those high growth sectors. So we work with Cape IT Initiative, uh, we work with many of these business partners to train young people with the right skills. And so their names are then loaded onto an uh, e-portal and big companies can then access those names so that we make Cape Townians work ready. Yeah. Tell me, and then, and then lastly, James, I mean, what have we been, man what has the city managed to do to assist small businesses in particular during this very difficult time of lockdown? You mentioned the fact that while other cities were closing down, Cape Town was working really hard to make sure that we keep economic activity. So what are a couple of things that we've managed to do to try and keep those businesses alive? 
I'm always excited to share the uh, small business support yeah. because, you know, that's the backbone of our city's economy. So, of course, our focus is on attracting foreign direct investment, helping local companies retain and expand on their production, on their employment, on their skills, because Cape Town has everything to compete with global markets around the world. But it's those SMMEs yeah. that keep this city going. It's about 80% of our city's economy. And so on the SMME side, we came up with a number of programs. Firstly, we rolled out a toolkit comprising of all the essentials required to keep small businesses open. Because the, the financial situation of many small businesses is of such a nature that they can't always afford yeah. all of these government imposed uh, regulations and uh, other health protocols. So we distributed thousands of SMME COVID-19 toolkits to small businesses to make sure that they are COVID compliant to keep those doors open. The second thing is we moved all of our training and uh, supply development workshops online. online. Yeah, yeah. And we're running them now online continuously. Uh, we've trained about 2,000 plus businesses on supply development and smart procurement because we want to create a, an ecosystem where small business can compete for big business. And so we are training small businesses uh, constantly on the supplier and smart procurement because that's how we build more resilient small businesses to withstand the shocks and the trends of the future. We also came up with a number of training workshops for small businesses in terms of um, how do they tender with government? Yeah. Because as you know, municipal governments are big procurer of goods and services. So we trained our small businesses how to tender, how to drop a business plan, how to get the startup funding. Mm -hmm. And so we work very closely with a number of other private and public sector agencies yeah. in terms of funding and other business support. Um, and so those were some of the measures. And th in fact, tomorrow yeah. we are launching a first of its kind. The business hub in Cape Town, we established in 2019 of August. And since then, this business hub has been working flat out to support small businesses. And tomorrow, we are taking it to the next level. We are launching a mobile business help desk uh, that will go to all corners of the city so that we go to small where businesses are. where it matters exactly. most, where they operate, exactly. to help them with their training and their business support. Yeah. So there's a couple of exciting things that we're working on, the yeah. Jobs Connect, yeah. the Cape Skills and Employment Accelerator, and then, of course, the SMME support programs. Yeah. So I think it's a matter of where there's a will, there's a way. Absolutely. Good James, thank, thank you, you so much for all the, all the work that you are doing. And then I think this just shows us that, you know, when cities are resilient and when cities innovate, they can really make a difference in people's lives. Thank you very much for joining us today. Pleasure. Thank cool. you very much. And this week in the spotlight, we're going to be discussing the land expropriation bill, which is before parliament. And essentially what we are looking at here is the real consequences which will allow certain certain circumstances for government to expropriate land without compensation. But we're looking at particularly how this has already been has already begun. Some of what we would call basically state sponsored land grabs where we have seen government essentially take away really productive land from people who are really deserving and allocating it to either connected cadres or it simply is under state control. Let's take a look at this story in the spotlight. Democratic Alliance is calling on Agricultural Minister Togo Dudiza to clean up the administration of state-owned land and to stop the evictions of emerging farmers from government property. The Democratic Alliance has been inundated by literally hundreds of pleas for assistance from across the length and breadth of South Africa, from farmers who should have been recipients of government's land reform program. Instead, they've been messed around, they've received eviction orders. Farmers are being lied to, they don't know what's going on, they being sent from pillar to post. They were told that they must vacate the land because the state will give it to someone else. The National Department of Rural Development and Land Reform are failing the farmers in South Africa. And they're being chased off the land that should be being used to help them advance, grow crops and become contributors to South Africa's food security. So this is the concern that we have and we are now asking the minister to stop these 
evictions of farmers on state land. The important part is that they get something, either title to the land or a proper lease agreement, because no institution in South Africa will help farmers if they don't have a proper something, some paper or a long-term lease. We decided to go out across South Africa and see for ourselves and speak to the people most affected. We have been speaking on the show about the expropriation bill bef currently before Parliament. If this bill passes into law, it will allow the ANC government to expropriate private property without any compensation. The ANC's proposal would undermine your, route to, your right to own all kinds of property, not just land, but this could be a car, this could be a house, or even intellectual property. During this week's episode, we take a look at what has been an ongoing and worrying trend of farmers being illegally evicted from land because they do not have the security of tenure. In some instances, farmers have been robbed of the land that they have lived on and they have worked on for decades. With those farms being used either as political uh, patronage for political cronies or simply being lost in the system. While these farmers have no, because all the while these farmers have absolutely no legal recourse because they are mere tenants of the state and they do not own the land. We know that the ultimate vision of the ANC and the EFF is, to, is for government to control as much land as possible, forcing South Africans to be permanent tenants of the state. This is in direct contrast to the DA's vision for South Africans to be empowered with full land ownership because we believe that having the secure, security of tenure over your land is the only way to advance economically. It's the only way that we can make sure that we can truly redress the injustices of the past. The current plight of farmers who have been illegally evicted is symptomatic of a totally dysfunctional land reform program that is failing to empower South Africans. Joining me today in studio is the DA Federal Chairperson and Western Cape Agriculture of MEC, Dr. Ivan Mayer. And we are also joined on Zoom by the Shadow Minister for Agriculture and Rural Development and Land Reform, Annette Stain. Ivan, I just want to welcome you once again for joining us today. Uh, I know you're not a stranger on the show. Uh, Ivan, just jumping straight into it, we've got a number of things to cover. I know you have been in intimately involved with the Ivan Kluter story. Uh, Ivan Kluter, the darling farmer who was evicted from his farm. Tell us a little bit about what's happened there and how we're intervening. No, thank you very much. Uh, see, we were, what we have seen there, uh, it is really land reform in South Africa through Ivan Kluter's case, is actually the mismanagement and fraud and corruption of land reform in South Africa. So that's a classical case study. I went to the farm Colenso near Darling. I've spoken to the farmer, mm. and he is now being evicted on his third farm. And as you know, in terms of the current regulations, uh, lockdown regulations, nobody must be evicted. So firstly, the National Department is acting illegally mm. by evicting uh, the person. The second issue that is happening here is a farm, his farm that he received through land reform is now being given through a politically connected MK shoulder. Mm. So this is politically connected individuals. But, see, we were, this is not the only case of a farmer being evicted, as you rightly uh, put out in your insert. This is expropriation without compensation. And this is actually a, a much bigger issue because what happened to Ivan Kluter, the farmer in Darling, will happen to ordinary South Africans. So this is a much bigger issue. This is, as you rightly pointed out, this is politically connected state caps of farmland. And it's a tragedy what has happened. But the DA will not sit back yeah. and observe this. And I'm thankful to our shadow minister, Annette Stein, who has been driving this issue. I brought this matter under the attention of Toko Dudiza, and she has absolutely ignored us. So this is an injustice, and that's why I went to the public protector and yeah. I lodged a complaint. That's incredible. I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, the fact that this, the, this, uh, doc, uh, um, Mr. Kluter has been moved around three farms. I mean, that is an unsustainable way of conducting business. I know, Ivan, that you went and visited um, uh, Mr. Kluter at his farm. And we're going to take a look now because he was unable to join us today. But we're going to take a look at what he had to say about his situation. Ivan, 
tell us about your experience in land reform. Thank you, Minister. Minister, this farm called Lenzo Farm in the West Coast District was allocated to me in 2000, April 2019. I was relocated from Gelukwaard's farm where I was brutally attacked. So the Department of Rural Development and Land Reform allocated Colenso Farm to me to continue with my farming activities, which is pig production, sheep production, and grain production. You can see here, lots of feed. We are active. We are active farming enterprise. A week ago, the Department of Rural Development and Land Reform, they came here. They uh, forced me. They wanted to force me to hand over the keys for the, for the farm. They wanted to force me to hand over the farming activities to a uh, okay. military, to a MK veteran. I refused, and they left here, and they eventually sent me, four days after that, they sent me a, a letter to demand me to hand over the keys of my farm that was allocated to me by them and my farming activities. Here I've got a letter here, a report from the Office of the Public Protector. It says very specifically, you were relocated to Colenso Farm in Darling on the West Coast and that the meeting was held with the department on 25 October 2019 to enter into a long lease of 30 years. Now the Department of Rural Development nationally, they completely ignore this. And I think it is injustices, as Minister said, it's unfair treatment, it is intimidation, it is harassment, and it is everything leads, leads to illegal eviction. Ivan, more than anything, I mean, for me, this is incredibly heartbreaking. I mean, here's a man who has mm. dedicated his life to this industry, has been an employer of people, and now he has been yanked away from his farm for people who are politically connected to gain? Well, uh, see, we were, it is now in the middle of the harvesting season. For a farmer, there's no big, bigger joy and bigger excitement during the year than the harvesting period. And here, during lockdown, we know specifically eviction of anybody is not allowed in terms of the regulations. And here, Toko Dudisa and the National Department is evicting this man. This is an injustice. And I'm so happy that uh, Annette, our shadow minister of land reform, has now referred this matter to the Human Rights Commission because this is a viral of his human rights. Yeah. I want to um, go back to Annette real quickly. Annette, I mean, um, Ivan talks about the Human Rights Commission complaint. Um, you've seen what Mr. Clute has said. I know that you've been working on this. Tell us a little bit more about this. Yes, thank you, Sabiwe and Ivan. Um, we've decided to take this to the Human Rights Commission because Ivan Clute is a perfect example but he's not the only person in South Africa. I have been visiting farmers since uh, June last year who have received similar threats and complaints to, to leave the land. The Human Rights Commission, I think, needs to deal with it. The Department of Agriculture, Rural Development and Land Reform is totally not um, on, on, on par with what is happening in land reform. They are advertising land, they are telling people to leave the land, they have lost, left people uh, in the lurch uh, without these agreements, without proper tenure rights on the land, and they were not helped. So I think it's very, very important for the department uh, to be investigated. Uh, and if we have an example like Ivan Kutter to start off with, but um, I'm still waiting for the Human Rights Commission to contact me. They did acknowledge the receipt of my complaint. I will also give them the other examples so that we can look exactly of what is happening in land reform in South Africa. Yeah. With people being left. And it's, I mean, I'm, I'm, I know that uh, last week you and John Stenazen visited the Kokstad area to meet with a number of farmers who have been treated similarly to um, Ivan Kluter. What is the situation on the ground? I mean, why are people being evicted from farms in the middle of harvesting season and essentially losing their life's work like this? Yeah, uh, Sviwe, I don't know what's going on. Uh, I, I became aware of this already in 2019. I, I raised this issue in our committee. The, demo, uh, the, the DG at that time said, no, um, he's aware of that, and they will put out a notice to say that it must immediately stop. It didn't stop. Um, I visited some farmers whose 
parents lived on that land. Some of them, their parents worked in the previous farm, so that the people that I visit now is the children of those parents. They've lived there, for, in some cases, for generations. That land was bought by the Department of Rural Development. It's now state land. And they are being told that they must evict the land. One of them, Mr. John Mabusa in Pumalanga, received an eviction letter sometimes last year. So all the farmers that's contacting me, I'm advising them not to vacate the land. Like we have seen the case of Mr. Digana in the Eastern Cape, who has left the land. Um, he was forced. He, the, the, the value arrived on the land. He wasn't there on the day. And he, they came and, and his cattle. he had a long battle to buy his cattle back um, uh, to get back. He was then off the land. He was evicted. So the struggle for Mr. Zigana is a long-term struggle. And that is why we decided to assist Mr. Ivan Kutte not yeah. to vacate the land. Because once you're off, you, you don't get back on any land. You are then, you know, Mr. Zigana is now forming along the roads uh, on the busy N2 highway with his cattle because he doesn't have any place to go to. I mean, and, and, the, and the biggest injustice of this, Annette, is that, you know, one of the things that we want to do, we want to make sure that black South Africans who are dispossessed of land have generational wealth that they can pass on to their children. And I mean, and so this is the problem with being a tenant on your land as opposed to being an owner of your land. Yes. And what is what, what makes this worse is the Department of Rural Development or the ANC government writes beautiful uh, policy statements about all kinds of things. The state land disposal policy clearly states that after five years, if you've been leasing land after five years, you, you can opt to become an owner. And we know the story of Mr. Hasse, where we fought, or he uh, has been on the land for 30 years, and he had to take the department to court. To, to, to get ownership of his land. So in this case, we are seriously fighting for farmers not to be evicted. Um, the department is using all kinds of silly reasons why they must apparently uh, get off the land. They give them uh, 48 hours or seven day notice, which is in itself illegal. Um, and as you say, during the harvest period now, uh, we are telling them not to leave the land. Um, I have put up a big fight in the department itself, uh, in our portfolio committee. And we are also calling on more farmers to contact us so that we can see how widespread is this problem. I'm dealing with Mr. Klutte and another farmer in the Western Cape. There's farmers in the Eastern Cape. There's farmers in Limpopo. There's farmers in Kulanga and in Gauteng. So I think it is a widespread thing that is happening all over the country. And, and and now, I mean, Annette, I mean, the, the expropriation bill that is now before Parliament, I mean, is going to make uh, this kind of activity a lot more common, um, where government talks about, yeah. in, in the bill, about, you know, the fact that they can expropriate land, particularly if it has been invaded. I mean, we know that land invasions are a big problem. Talk to us about, you know, what yeah. are the dangers of some of these clauses in the bill? Yes, if you read Section 12, uh, 3 C, it says notwithstanding registration of ownership in terms of the Deeds Registration Act, so a person has title deed to his land, when an owner has abandoned the land by failing to exercise control over it. So we are also receiving letters from people who said, well, I can't farm any longer on this land because there's land invasions. A lot of people came and just invaded the land, and we know if you want to um, get people off your land that has invaded the land, you must get rid of them within 24 hours with the assistance of the police. The police do nothing. If people invade any pieces of land, the police absolutely do nothing. Then you must go to court. It is a long, drawn-out, costly uh, exercise for owners to then protect their properties. Yeah. Um, that is also what we see in this land reform cases. Um, Farmers who's on the land because they didn't get lease agreements from the state. Uh, just people come and invade and, you know, they just can't do anything because the state tells them, well, it's not your property, it's ours. So it is really, really very problematic. Uh, so we, we, we need to look at all these issues very carefully and warn people of what 
could become a, a massive uh, expropriation situation if people invade your property. And lastly, Annette, I mean, I want to I want to come back here because, I mean, this is such a huge issue because land invasions are common in the country. And so if people are said to, if, you know, if they're unable to get people off within 24 hours, they lose their life's work. I mean, Dada Rahatse, whom we, in, we in, interviewed with you a couple of weeks ago, had a similar situation on his own farm. And, I mean, and it was a problem because he wasn't an owner of the land. Yes, um so the view, I think the, the, the crux of the matter here is that the government doesn't know what property they own. Uh, sure. Property is under municipalities, it's under districts, it's under provinces, it's under national departments, it's under rural development, it's under public works, it's under kinds of national departments. And we know that a few years ago, the Department of Rural Development under Minister Nkwenti was trying to do a land audit. But they just can't do it. You know, they don't know what property they own. So the problem that we are sitting with is we need a land administration system so that anyone can go and see who's on the land, what is it being used for, what is available. Because we know a lot of people invade land because they're looking for housing opportunities. And, we, you know, we need to fix that um, in order to ensure that that we, we, we don't have this illegal invasions of land all over the country. And I think that's such an important point to make that, uh, that Annette makes, Ivan, that, you know, of course, I mean, we're not vilifying this, but I mean, ultimately people are also desperate and they go and invade pieces of land. But that's why you need your legal protection as a farmer so that you can be able to have legal recourse so that you can go and essentially force people off your land. Yes, uh, see, we were, that's why in the Western Cape, uh, Annette is absolutely right. People are invading lands because of a housing need. Yeah. So our Department of Human Settlements have now set aside 355 million rand uh, to assist with the prevention of illegal land invasions. But you've uh, earlier, see, Weber, you've asked, what is happening here? Yeah. Well, this is a classical case of Venezuela. Mm. What has happened in Venezuela is happening right now. In 1999, they changed the constitution in Venezuela. Then they passed a law for the expropriation of compensation without compensation in 2011. What happened then? Politicians benefited from land reform in Venezuela. What happened then? Food production declined. There was a shortage of food. People had to queue for foods and there were eventually food riots as a result of food insecurity. The food trucks were then hijacked. Yeah. Then they brought in the army to distribute your food, and when the army does that, there's nobody on the border, and then your economy collapse. Today, the inflation rate in Venezuela is one million percent. Mm. Now, that's what's happening here, and I think this issue of land invasion, yeah. the issue of expropriation is a much more bigger issue, and that's why we're calling on anybody that has evidence of expropriation without compensation, any farmer that has been illegally evicted to please contact the Democratic Alliance, contact Annette, stay in our shadow minister, even contact me, go to our website. We are here to defend the rights of people that face injustices. Yeah. Because this, you've asked earlier, what is happening? This is state capture of farmland in South Africa. Yeah. And I mean, Ivan, this is not just an elitist issue, right? I mean, some of the work that uh, Annette has been doing has been helping farmers who have been farming here for, for, for decades. But people who are also employers, but also people who have become permanent uh, uh, tenants of the state. And that's why we're fighting against this bill to say that we want people to own um, um, their the, the, the property. What is the key difference between what the ANC is proposing in terms of land ownership and what the, the DA is, is proposing? That's a very interesting question, Asibwebe, because the ANC firstly wants to take your property, as we have seen in the cases. Secondly, they want to take, take your property without compensation. Then you must rent the property. Then the state owns the property and you become landless. That's the ANC model of land reform. Mm. What is the, the strategy of the Democratic Alliance? Firstly, where the ANC takes your land and your property, we believe in the DA, you must keep your property we, because we respect your investment. You've spoken about 30 years. That's a long investment. We believe uh, respect the investment, respect successful land reform, 
and you must own yeah. your land, not rent your land. Because when you own it, you have a t- title deed. Yeah. When you have a title deed, you have access to finance, loans, and security. When you have a title deed, you own your land. When the ANC rent your land, you become landless mm. because they can grab your land anytime, as we've seen with Ivan Klut and many others that Annette is talking about. So the fundamental difference between the DA and the ANC and the EFF is we say give people title deeds yeah. so that you can own your property because agriculture is the only sector that grew in the first and second quarter in 2020. We had 28% economic growth, 15% economic growth. We are now in South Africa busy with economic recovery. And the sector that has the biggest potential for economic recovery is agriculture. Yeah. So we cannot destroy agriculture and the land issue is central to this. Mm. And I mean, so, so and I mean, the, the, uh, you say, I mean, the key thing is that the DA believes in ownership of your land and the ANC believes in permanent tenancy. Now, I mean, this is also very key, not just to economic, um, you know, to, to, to unlock economic opportunities for farmers, but it's also critical for redress. It's very critical for redress. One of the principles of the Democratic Alliance is redress, and part of redress is to allow people to own their property, yeah. give them title deeds, so that they can build a future for their family. Mm-hmm. But when do you rent your land, then the state, owns the land and the state can come any time, like in this case of Mr. Ivan Kluter, they are now wanting to allocate his farm to an MK vet- veteran who has no experience of agriculture. And I think this is an injustice. That's why I lots of complaint at the public protector. That's why Annette went to the Human Rights Commission. And I will now also ask the Auditor General to do a full investigation into this land reform because there's massive financial misconduct and corruption involved. Yeah, and and, and I mean, and, th- and then just last year on this, I mean, the other issue here is that, that Annette was talking about is that also you've got complete breakdown of the administration in the department where the department has no idea of how much land they own, where it is, and the like. And so, I mean, what what happens when the majority of land in South Africa is owned by the state? I mean, it's going to lead to a complete collapse. The ANC government has no system of administration. I'm the MEC for agriculture. Every three years, I do a flyover project. I fly over every farm here in the Western Cape. We can tell you exactly we, we, the farm, what is the commodities on the farm, is there water on the farm? Who's the owner of the farm? What was the last three years' production on the farm? We have a very detailed, uh, as Annette said, uh, land administration system. Yeah. But in the rest of the country, nothing has happened. That's why people must vote for the yeah. Democratic Alliance in this election, because we will be able to fix South Africa. Absolutely. And now, and, and excitingly, Ivan, I mean, what, one of the things that we are doing today is that we are launching a new email hotline. As, uh, as, as Annette has said, I mean, this is not just a, 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 a unique situation just to Ivan Clute or some of the farmers that she met in Gokstad. This is a recurring thing. And so what we've done is that we've, we are launching this email hotline called land at da.org.za, where farmers who've been dispossessed of their land they've, or they're being threatened with illegal evictions must contact us in the Democratic yes. Alliance so that we can do everything in our power to try and stop that. Because our view is that people should not, firstly, be tenants at all, and secondly, they should not be illegally evicted from their farms. And so we will have the, the details on the screen, but please, if you do know of anybody, if you are that person, please make contact with us so that we can assist. Uh, that's very important, and I'm very happy that you will put it on the screen, land at da.org to South Africa, because the Democratic Alliance will fight for all people in South Africa. This is not only land, this is property. It can yeah. be your house, it can be something else. So this is not about only uh, land expropriation, this is about property. Mm-hmm. And so we must stand united in South Africa and stop the ANC before it's too late. We have the lessons of Venezuela, we have the lessons of Zimbabwe, and we cannot go there. We've seen what has happened in Zimbabwe. All the Zimbabwe people are in South Africa. They run away because of what uh, Robert Mugabe did there with land reform. So it is very important, as we were, if there are people that know about people that have been treated unjustly, the Democratic Alliance will be fighting for you because this is certainly something that we cannot allow to happen. This is unconstitutional. It's a violation of your constitutional rights and it is a violation of your rights in terms of administrative justice. And we are so happy that 
a net is driven, and because of the pressure of a net a Noko and Tandeka yeah. in the National Assembly, the National Minister uh, Toko Rodiza has now admitted that there is administrative errors <laughs> in that department, and this is because of the pressure of the Democratic Alliance. And we want more farmers to come forward so that we can also fight for them. Absolutely. And let's, I mean, I'm going to last parting shots from you. How are you and your team in Parliament driving this issue so that we can make sure that we make real change um, for people on the ground? Yes. I'm just a view it, as I said, the fact is only actually coming out now. Yesterday in our portfolio committee, we, we, we have seen the Department of, of Land Reform, which last year they were still on their own, not part of agriculture. They, the Auditor General came and uh, gave us the overview of the annual report, which was submitted very, very late, only in end of February this year. And one of the reasons for the late submission is that the, uh, the entity called Agricultural Land Holdings Account could not uh, give account to 500 million rand in, in the, the, the last year, um, 2019-20 year report. And that is the entity that is supposed to looking after all agricultural state land in the department. I've been having a problem with them for a long time. It's an entity they're supposed to be coming to do their own uh, presentation. We've never seen the agricultural land holdings account. So I suspect there's massive corruption we will first deal with it in our portfolio committee and then if needs be, as Ivan mentioned, rights to the Auditor General or to the SCOPA portfolio to see if they can investigate that uh, department itself. They are supposed to be getting um, uh, the least uh, amounts in from farmers. They're supposed to be buying land, all of that. So I think there's a big, big land scandal sure. waiting to be uncovered. Strength to your arm and your team, uh, Annette. Um, as, as we've discussed here today, land is not just about economic opportunities, but it's also about redress. And we want to make sure that uh, South Africans are landowners and they're not just tenants. Um, and they can essentially be able to hand over uh, some of that property to their kids and so that we can start to fix the inequalities in our country. So we will be back after this. Africa with local government elections coming up later this year, please do check your voter registration status at check.da.org.za and make sure that come election day you are ready to play your part in saving South Africa. Until next week, keep it tidy, Mzadzi.